Uh, today, a lecture will uh, be related with meditation, which is uh, the main aspect in the Eightfold Path. We are going to analyze because the Eiffel path is a path that can be only seen or shown by the inner sight or the insight. This path is not a path that you can see outside, but it's a path that is inside. And uh, this is why in Buddhism, We emphasize in the technique of meditation or in meditation. When you think about Buddhism, the first image that comes into your mind, at least, at least in my mind, is the Buddha in a state of meditation. with his eyes slightly open and contemplating himself. So, this is why when we talk about Buddhism, immediately we associate that with meditation. And actually, uh, the different techniques in meditation are being taught in Buddhism. And in Gnosticism, <coughs> we know that Buddha is an, an entity, a part, which is within each one of us, that we call the innermost. Beyond the Buddha, the Master Samael Onveor stated in the Pisti Sophia, we find the Adi Buddha, which is, of course, the being of our being, or we will say the Buddha of our Buddha, the non being of the being. The main aspect of Buddhism is the control of the mind. That's why many people think that uh, Buddhism is in relation with mental practices or mental power. <coughs> but the reality is that Buddhism, meditation, is a technique for the consciousness, not for the mind. That we control the mind with uh, meditation or through meditation is another thing. But really, the discipline of the mind is acquired through meditation, which is a technique for the consciousness. A technique from which, uh, through which the buddhatta, and here is another term that we use a lot in Gnosticism. As you see there, it's associated with Buddha. Because really the Buddhata is that part of our own particular monad or Buddha. The essence that we have, unfortunately, bottled up 
within the different psychological aggregates that are uh, trapped or, uh, or live, we will say, live within our mind. So you see, the Buddha, the essence, the consciousness, the soul, the part of Buddha, or the part of the monad, unfortunately, lives strapped within the mind. And that's why, or this is the reason why Buddhism emphasized of the control of the mind in order to liberate the Buddha, the essence. So Buddha really, or our own particular innermost, really cares about our Buddha, our essence, and wants to control the mind. The mind itself, in Sanskrit, is manas, and from that word comes the word man. <coughs> That's why the real man is the one that is controlled by the spirit, by the Buddha. And this is explained in the word human, that I said in many other lectures, whom is the Buddha, the spirit, that has to control the manas. But in order to control the manas, the mind, the spirit does it through the buddhata, which in synthesis is the human soul that is developed through willpower. Our motto is telema, willpower. So this willpower, this buddhata, that is in contact with the being, is the one that controls the mind. And this is something that we have to understand and comprehend because many people or many Gnostics do not understand the necessity of meditation or the practice of meditation. And it's because they do not understand that the path that is written by many initiates in many books of many religions are only symbols that we need to interpret in meditation. Because the only one that speaks that language is the Buddha, the innermost, the spirit. You see, when we said meditation, we always associate that with silence. And it is written that the voice of the silence is a voice of Buddha. But it's referring to the silence of the mind. In other words, with the, when the mind is silent, then we can hear the voice of the spirit. Then we can hear the voice of Buddha. If the mind is active, then the ego is active. And the ego is not the Buddha. The ego is symbolized in many ways with uh, the symbols of the devil, Satan, Mara, etc. So, When you want to go from one side of a mountain into the other side by walking through the mountain, you have to walk, you have to make your own way by walking. You open your way. If you imagine better, 
let's say, in winter. Because really, uh, speaking of symbols, winter is a symbol of karma. So imagine a snowy mountain in which the snow is very smooth. And you have to walk to the other side of the mountain, but there is no way shown there. So by walking with your steps, you leave the prints and you leave the track of the path towards the other side. By walking, you see in every step different uh, scenarios that comes into your sight, into your, to the sounds of your ears, etc. And while you walk in, the scenario of nature is changing. And of course, all of that is what we call symbols. When you reach the other side, obviously, you recognize in your mind all the images of those symbols, trees, clouds, birds, etc., that you saw in your way. And then you go back through your prints that you left in the snow. And when you reach the other side, you decide to guide others. When you turn to the prints of your foot or your feet, you realize that nature already changed that because snow again. You see, the recycling of the events of nature is making the, that mountain again smooth. So the track that you left there disappeared. But it didn't disappear in yourself in your memory. You already have that experience. You have that uh, practical walk in your mind and you know how to go into the other side. And you know that even though the path disappear on the snow or in the snow, the same scenarios, images, etc. are still there and you can guide anyone through the mountain. But all, obviously, <coughs> everybody can write about that in accordance to his own uh, impressions and to leave uh, the, the map of that uh, path. And this is precisely what the Master Samael on the or did in the three mountains. He wrote about the map of the path of the self-realization. But you have to understand that uh, the Master Samael on the or walk through that path according to his own karma. According to his own karma. He walked that path according, in accordance with his own karma. And this is something that we have to remember. Because even though he left the print in the snow, you cannot walk with the same feet, with the same shoes. Because everyone has a different size of shoe. Has a different weight. In other words, has a different karma. As to walk, follow the signs that are written in that book, The Three Mountains. But those steps has to be applied according to our own particular individual karma. And that's why, this is why we cannot take literally what is written. Because every symbol... Everything is giving us a clue. In order for us to apply that clue in our life, in our path. 
And this is how you find here the necessity of meditation. Because that clue, that archetype, that symbol, has to be applied to our own particular life. So the path is there. That's why when you read the life <coughs> of any initiate, you find always the same archetypes, same symbols. The life of Jesus, for instance, is written in the four Gospels. But it is not his private life, but his spiritual life, meaning the way in how he walk on the path, the steps. And this is how we have to understand the four Gospels, that we have to follow those steps in order to reach the other side. So if we confuse those symbols with the true life, physical life that he had as any citizen in the world, then we make a big mistake. And that's precisely the big mistake of all of those people that want to find uh, the track, or we will say the prince of the life of Jesus or Buddha or any other master that is written in this book or in this other book. Because those uh, writings were written by initiates in order to show the path in our symbols. So, of course, the true life, physical life of Master Jesus, how he lived and how he uh, ate or ate and did his chores in every day life, that's something that was not written in any book. Because for us, what is important are the symbols. Hmm? Are the the, the map, right, of the path that we need to follow. And do we, we should not mistake that. <coughs> That's why we need to meditate. That's why always we say meditate. Because the symbols that we receive internally are applied to our own particular idiosyncrasy, which is related with karma and the place, the life that we live. It depends on the city we are living, and even related with our family, because karma is related with our family, etc. It's coming into my mind this uh, uh, a simple phrase. And when the mother of Jesus Christ and his brothers are outside, and one of his disciples says, your mother and your brothers are waiting for you outside. I want to talk with you. And then he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? But only he who follows the path of my father. There's a simple explanation of a symbol there. So if you see your brother in dreams, obviously, is the symbol of somebody close to you that follows the same path. So, in the path, we need to see the track, we need to see our steps. In this daily life, in the physical world, we are always identified with our daily life. And uh, we need insight. We need to see our own spiritual life, which is related directly with the Buddha, with the essence. That's why we said, or we emphasize always, that the true initiate is always living in two worlds. Or, as we say in symbology, we have to resolve an equation. 
which is our own life. The first equation or the first half of that equation is how to survive in this physical world. Which everybody is concerned about. In order to survive in this day and age, we need to make money to supply all our necessities. But the other half of the equation has nothing to do with money. It's something very individual, particular. That we need to go inside because the other half of the equation is in those internal worlds where the path of the self-realization is shown. Because it's the self-realization of the being. You hear that? We want the self-realization of the being. We always, when we talk about uh, the constitution of the being or the true man, we always start from the bottom. We said physical body, vital body, astral body, mental body, causal body, beauty body, and spiritual body. But the reality is backwards. The first body is Atman, the Buddha, the interior Buddha, the true man inside. And below it, or him, we find six bodies. Being the physical body, the last one, in which part of him is bottled up, which is ourselves, the Buddha. <coughs> Actually, the physical body is the opposite of Atman. That's why, esoterically, we said the physical body is the devil. But not only the physical body, but the mental body as well. From the mental body below, we have to control, or the Buddha, uh, the Buddha has to control, through the Buddha, the four bodies, and then to acquire self-realization. And of course, the Buddha, that is part of that Buddha, needs guidance. We always emphasize in lectures that the real guru, the real Buddha, the real master that we need to follow is inside, not outside. We are right now in this lecture given the clues, the signs, the symbols. As when you read the Bible, you find the same symbols written in one way. Moses wrote also his own symbols in one way. Buddha, the life of Buddha, you find the same symbols in that way. And every religion, every sacred book gives the same signs in different ways. Those are the same archetypes that we need to follow. So when you read those sacred books of any religion, as when you hear this lecture, you are just studying the track, the steps that you had to follow. But obviously, you don't have to stay just there or stop there. You have to go and to apply those symbols inside. And for that, you need meditation. Because it's only through meditation, the way in which the Buddha is in contact with the Buddha. Obviously, there are initiates whose Buddha is pretty awakened, is a bodhisattva. And that contact, that union with the Buddha, interior Buddha, is always constant, permanent. And they are receiving uh, permanent messages because the religion, the union, the you is already there. But we are beginners, and we know that our Buddha, ourselves, we are not receiving that continuous or permanent information from our own particular Buddha. So therefore, 
the main teachings of any self-realized master is to teach you how to be in contact, in daily, permanent contact with your own particular innermost. Because from him, you will receive the information, directly information, that concern only to you, and only to be united with him. And here, behold, the necessity of meditation. How are you going to listen to the voice of the silence if you are not entering into meditation? Core techniques exist there, many. In order to put the mind in blank or in silence, in order to hear the voice of God, which is the voice of the silence. But I ask you an answer to yourselves. Where did Buddha Sakyamuni learn those techniques? Or where did the first Buddhas before him learn that? We have to understand that they learned that by doing it. Many of us always are waiting or wishing to have special clues of meditation in order to receive immediate illumination. And that's, of course, stupid. And that's why many Gnostics are there experiencing with mushrooms, with yage, and many other plants in order to have immediate illumination. They want to awake completely and to see the path there before them, from the beginning to the end. But nobody can see the path like that. Even the one that is repeating the same path cannot see the path from the beginning to the end again, because the path will be applied to the karma that he or she has again, which is double or triple. It's different. The same steps, yeah, but not the same path applied to it. And, and if you go to the mountain and you want to go to the other side of the mountain, stay there, you will see the beginning of the path, but you cannot see the end of the path. But you can see it if you walk and you reach the other side, and then you will see the whole thing. So how are these individuals that want to see the whole path, want to awaken on the astral plane to see the whole path. Now I know how to walk. No. The path is being done at the same step. While you're walking, you are making and seeing the path. The path is mysterious. The Master says in the Great Rebellion, sometimes you find abysses. Sometimes you find a lagoon, a river that you have to walk through. That's a symbol of something. You have to swim. In my case, for instance, when I find a river or, or a sea in front of my path internally, I don't swim. I just go walk and breathe profoundly and suck all the water. And I said, I had to learn how to breathe the water. For me, that's the best. Others like to swim on top of the water. I like to go within. And the, the, there's a big difference. This is meditation. <coughs> Symbol of something that you had to accommodate yourself. But you see how different, it, it different your, your, according to your nature. This is precisely a, a very important because you have to learn how to see the path. But don't expect that you see, uh, you will see the path, yes, in front of you from the beginning at the end. And I said, oh, I have to walk to this. And you are seeing it. No. You are seeing it little by little as a measure you walk. And if you reach the goal, then you will see the whole thing. That's why the Master Samael said, I walked three times. But this time was very hard, he says. Too much pain. 
that means, in other words, too much karma. Obviously, the first time that he walked the path was not too hard. The second was hard, but no harder at the third. And he says, I don't think I want to do it a fourth time. Because it will be harder. You see, karma will be stronger. Of course, the same steps, the same images. But you have the burden you have to carry on your shoulders will be different. That's why it is not wise to try to imitate the life of a master. Or that said that because this initiate passed through this way in his initiation, everybody has to do the same thing. That's, that's a stupid. Because each one of us has different karma. And the path is lived according to your own karma. Mm -hmm. It's not the same to walk on the path one time, two times, three times, four times. It is written that you can walk the same path of self-realization seven times. But each time is harder and harder. Look, the Master Jesus of Nazareth, the Master of Veramento. The last time that he did it was the seventh time. And the great sacrifice that he did for this planet is still doing it. Great work. But of course, in order to walk in that path, he meditated. Because it's the only way to walk in it. Nobody can walk on the path if he or she doesn't meditate. Because the only way to defeat ordeals, obstacles, is by cleaning oneself, to what to opening the way in front of us by knowing ourselves. Because the path is within. And that's why you find that the Buddha, Gautama Sakyamuni, defeated all of his ordeals of his path while he was in meditation under the body tree. Which you know that the body tree is a symbol of the sexual energy. And body also means wisdom, which in Hebrew means chokmah, which is Christ. And of course, it is written that while Buddha was meditating, in order to nature, or the forces of nature, or the forces or, or the negative forces of nature to avoid him to meditate, a great flood came. But the Buddha kept meditating, kept his meditation, and a serpent came and entwined in his bottom three times and a half, I mean a gigantic serpent, and served him as a float, as a, uh, how do you call, a floating element or device for him not to to drown not to get uh, not to die in the waters that serpent of course is a symbol when you read that if you think that really was a big serpent helping him not not to uh, to get sink into the waters you might really think in the wrong way because the serpent is a symbol of the Divine Mother. Meaning that the waters of degeneration, the sexual waters of fornication, that were, of course, attacking him. It's on nature, obviously. This is precisely what happens with the Gnostics. In the beginning, they want to learn how to transmute the sexual energy. But their own negative nature flows inside of them, right? And they get desperate. Wet dreams, lustful dreams. What to do? 
Be calm. And put your faith in your Buddha. Because if you keep ahead in calm, in understanding, comprehending your own lust, the serpent will come and save you from those waters that want to kill you. That's the symbol of that. <coughs> and this is how we have to be. Do not expect that the waters will be always calm. The Buddha was there meditating, and the great flood came. But his own mother saved him. And I keep meditating. And you know the story. Mara and his three daughters came and tempted him. If you saw that movie, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the, of the, of the movie, in which you see how the great winds and tempest and uh, demons were attacking him, and he was just in meditation. It doesn't mean that the Buddha was there without eating, without doing anything for many days, weeks, and months, and finally he acquired illumination. That's a symbol that we have to understand, meaning that in order for him to acquire illumination, he was always, always meditating. But obviously he was receiving impressions. He was uh, working with the other half of the equation, receiving impressions. And going always at the end of his uh, journey to meditate. In order to uh, keep ahead in his path. That's the symbol of that. That's why, you see, when you interpret the symbols in the wrong way, there are many hermits there that go into the mountain. And sit there for hours, days and weeks, like fakirs. Trying to acquire illumination with the ego alive. We don't deny that with that way of life, or that discipline, they learn how to control the mind. And eventually they leave the mind, the ego, and they have samadhis. And after having samadhis, or maha samadhis, or nirvikalpa samadhis, they realize that they think, I am servialized. Because in the samadhi you receive a great voltage of energy. It is good to meditate in order to have a samadhi. But it's bad to think that because we are receiving that voltage of energy and illumination in the activity of our uh, inner senses, we are self-realized. That's wrong. Self-realization is only acquired when we defeat Mara and his three daughters. And that is a process of illumination, annihilation of the ego that we had to acquire. But many hermits, yogis, monks do not understand that. And because they are skillful in samadhi, they think that they are done. And you see the big mistake? This is precisely the big mistake in meditation. Do not think that you are done just because you have some experiences, some, some samadhis. Personally, I experience the ains of. I am not proud of admitting this because I have ego. And not because I experience the ains of, I would say, oh, I am self-realized. No. I experience also Keter. That's why when I talk about the Sephiroth, it's because I experience that. But I didn't self-realize my, my Sephiroth inside of me. I have ego. So I have to keep ahead. I'm not going to, to, to boast that I'm self-realized master because I am not. And the same thing, or because I learned, because I study the doctrine of uh, Bodhisattva, the doctrine of Samael on the Or. And he explained that very much. That even if you experience Samaris or every day, even if you build your solar bodies, if you don't annihilate your ego, you don't self-realize. And this is something that, thank goodness, I understand. And I, I want you to understand that. Because on the path, 
you receive a lot of illumination, a lot of visions, but that's not self-realization. That's just incentives, blessings that you can receive through meditation on the path because you deserve it, because you are dealing with this or that devil that we have within. And this is how you advance little by little. Otherwise, you fall in, those, in, in the mistake of many Buddhist sects now, that they are only emphasizing meditation, and they think that I, I had to achieve samadhi. I, I, I had to know how to, how to learn how to meditate. I had to follow this technique, this other technique. And they are just entangled and identified with techniques. And they forget about the comprehension of the ego. They follow this intellectually, and they are wasting time. Wasting time in the sense that they do not understand that they are good. But that's not enough. You have to go beyond that. And as Buddha and other masters learn how to meditate by themselves, also we can learn that. And when I say to meditate by themselves, meaning that only through the comprehension of the ego is how we advance on the path. You can follow techniques in order to, to, to have samadhis. But the only technique in order to comprehend the ego is doing it yourself because it's your ego. How are you going to comprehend, for instance, lust? Somebody can write, for instance, the Master Samael can write a book, and he wrote a book about lust, put some examples there. And he gave uh, the story of his life about he, how he was lustful in different ways. But that's his life. It's not my life. I'm not going to comprehend my ego of lust because I read his books. I want to comprehend my lust if I comprehend my lust. Because my lust is ready with my karma, with my own life, with my own way of being. It's different. And likewise, each one of you has different lust. It's always lust, but it applies or is acting in different ways. So this, this is the same path, but we have to understand that, that the comprehension of the ego is only possible by teaching yourself. And that's why we have internally our own guru. That's why we said, follow your own guru. Your own guru is inside of you. It's your own Buddha. He knows you very well. And he has a, 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 a great messenger there, a great uh, helper. And the one that uh, trained you is his own shadow. That shadow is called Lucifer. Lucifer is the one that comes down, or Satan, and helps God. It's coming to my mind, Job, the book of Job in the Bible. It says that Satan goes before Jehovah, and Jehovah says, Oh, well, how do you see my bodhisattva, my human soul, my servant, Job? He's working there, he's an initiate, he's doing well. And then Satan, in his own way, said, well, if you want to see if really he is doing his own way, you want me to test? Because he is advancing, but has to pass the test. This is why like, you go to university. Oh, he's a good student. He's the best one. Oh, yeah. Let's see if he passed the test. And then if the final test is what tells you you are ready to be graduated. Otherwise, you don't pass. The same thing is with God and the civilization. You are working yourself, you are doing this, you are doing that, but then Satan comes and says, okay, let's test it now. Let's test this guy to see if we really deserve that. And if you pass a temptation, and then you acquire light. But unfortunately, most of the tests that are put in by Satan to humanity, humanity is a failure. They didn't pass the test. Simple tests. And of course, when you enter into the initiation, into this path, you have to understand that. That is a tester. There's somebody there that is going always to serve your inner God by tempting you to see if you really are advancing. And this is precisely the meaning here of Lucifer, Satan, that people do not understand. People uh, hate Satan or Lucifer without understanding that it's a shadow that is doing his job. If there is no temptation, if there is no test, there is no virtues. How are we going to see if we are going doing well? 
if there is no temptation, if there is no test. And that's why it's written. You see, for instance, in the case of Jesus of Nazareth, he went into the temple of John the Baptist, who was the reincarnation of Elias. It's written in symbology in the Gospels, but really, in the Jordan at that time, there was a temple. And the priest of that temple was John the Baptist. And he initiated Jesus there with the baptism, which is the symbol of the initiation. It's written there that Jesus came out of the waters and the Spirit of God incarnated in him. But that's a great symbol of a process of transformation. And when he was there ready with the Spirit of God within himself, what happened? He says, well, he already passed all the ordeal of transmutation and he learned how to transmute his sexual waters. Obviously, his kundalini is rising up. The bronze serpent is giving him a lot of powers. But now, <clears throat> in order for him to teach to the multitudes, he had to pass the test. So the spirit took him into the wilderness. It's written, in order to be tempted by the devil. And he fasted 40 days. It doesn't mean just, just that he was just starving. To fast. What is to fast? Meaning, not to feed your ego. Right? 40 days. That reminds me uh, the letter Mem in Kabbalah. Which value is 40. 40 days of fasting. 40 days of the universal flood. For the years that the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness. 40, 40. Because 40 precisely is that related with water. In which you had to learn. Mm -hmm. How to control your waters. How to be in chastity. That's the waters. Because the whole work... Is the control of the waters, the control of the sexual energy, whose chief commander is Lucifer. He's the one that controls the waters, the sexual force. So if you don't control the waters, you don't control Lucifer. If you are a slave of sex, you are a toy of Lucifer. And that's why Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And why the devil told him? Oh well, yeah, you are a son of God, right? Eh? You are a bodhisattva. So you are wanted to illumination, to receive your inner being and to help humanity. Why don't you make more wisdom by transmuting sexual energy? Or in other words, may this stone be transformed into bread. The stone is a symbol of Yasaw, the sexual force. Transform into the bread of transubstantiation. Wisdom. Of course, when we transmute the sexual energy, we receive a lot of wisdom. But then Jesus says, well, <clears throat> not only sexual magic, I need to meditate. Because also wisdom comes, or the bread comes, from the mouth of God. But in order to hear the voice of the silence, the word of God... You had to keep your mind in silence. And Satan works through the mind with all of his aggregates. Lust, greed, pride, envy, etc. To quiet that, to comprehend that, need patience. And then you hear the voice of the silence because you need guidance. Your guru, your own God, your inner self tells you, do this now. Do that now, right? And but Satan, the mind, <coughs> will always <coughs> will always tempting you. <clears throat> Isn't that? But remember that Mara, Mara has three daughters, and that's why Jesus is tempted three times. Because one daughter first, and then the other, and then the other. The second 
I don't know if I am naming them in the right number as it's written in the Bible, but it's like that. But the second temptation says, if you are a son of God, go to the top of the temple or to the top of the mountain and throw yourself into the abyss because then God will send you angels And uh, he will sustain you on the air in order for you not to die against the rock. Right? Against the rock. Sex, obviously. Because on the path or in the path, sometimes you need to descend into the ninth sphere. But not to following your mind, not by following your lust, but your inner God. That's why it says, don't tempt. You shall not tempt your God. You, you shall only obey your God. You have to hear from your God, descend. Let me see here, we have the... He said, yeah. Then was Jesus led up, up of the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Yeah, it's not the same thing that I have here. The first temptation says... If you thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So you understand that, right? That the word that comes from the mouth of God is the is, is, is word of the innermost, the voice of the silence, when the mind is silent, when Satan is shut up, Because not only, uh, I mean, in the intellect, you will receive uh, wisdom. You need to learn about the archetypes, the symbols. Because God speaks with symbols. So you have to learn his language. God is God. It's a complicated language. Your spirit, your Buddha. Now obviously, the Buddha learns that by meditation. Because I repeat, the archetypes, the symbols, are applied to your own life, to your own self. Because everyone has a different karma. Then says, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Lest, at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. As I said, in the path, the initiate received the command, descend into a nice sphere. But sometimes it doesn't come like I'm saying right now. Hey, son, come here. Go into the nice sphere and transmute. No. It's a symbol. And if you don't know how to interpret that symbol, then that's why you need meditation. It's coming into my mind, the Master Samael on Veor. His divine mother was fighting against an ego of himself. And then she was commanding him and to, to see to, the, to one side of, of, of herself. And, she, and he saw apocalyptic fires that was destroying, right? And he understood there was the fires of sex. And then, and then he said, unfortunately, at that time, I was dumb. I thought that my divine mother was testing me. So therefore, I was disobeying and I was not practicing sex magic because I was in abstinence. I was meditating and not touching my wife, he said, and just annihilating my ego as a single person. And I was disobeying. 
he was commanding me to go into the sex, but I was rejecting that because I thought it was a test. Later on, he understood. Why? Because in his path, he found a guardian when he was entered into the temple. The guardian told him, you were the more advanced of our students here in this temple, but now you are stagnant. And then he asked the guardian, why? Why am I stagnant? And then the guardian answered him, because you forgot your mother. And he said that when he said that, he felt so much pain in the heart. And he interpreted the voice of, of the guardian in the wrong way. He thought that he was talking about his physical mother. Then when he returned to the physical plane, he says that he was trying to find his physical mother in order to advance in the path. And during meditation, because the, the, way, the, the way that he was trying to find his physical mother, that who knows where, where she was or maybe dead, because he, he was always, I mean, in the path and he forgot about, he was not attached to his family. He was trying to find her physically. In meditation, trying to, to get information from his inner being, suddenly, the voice of the silence came into his head. And he understood in one moment, one second, oh, my divine mother. And then he invoked his divine mother. And then after that happened many things, and he understood that he had to descend into the ninth sphere in order to annihilate that devil. That his own sexual force by, as a single was not enough. He needed the sexual force of his wife in order to make a very strong fire and to destroy that, de that demon. This is how I return, he says, into the ninth sphere again. This obviously, you see, was a command of his inner being. But even he didn't understand the symbol. But finally. But how, he, how did he find the meaning of that symbol? By meditating. Meditating, meditating finally. So this is how it happens. Don't get how you call uh, impatient or disappointed because in the beginning you really don't find the answer immediately in meditation <coughs> it's a process of learning and we need patience patience of job because always the devil appears so we have to be very careful that the commands are received by the Father and not by it's, it's the tempter, yeah, but the tempter, the tempter is Satan, Lucifer. But the Divine Mother is not the tempter. The inner being is not the tempter. It's Satan. This is a, a big mistake there. So he can command you, descend, do this, do that. And then you said, but after doing the, or walking on the step, because it's your path, you have to be sure that the step that you're going to, to do is right there on the path because there is abysses in each side of the path. And you have to meditate. My God, I understand your message, but tell me again. Is that right? And then he receives, and you are sure, oh, that's right. But again, he says, no, no, no. It's right, but who knows? My mind is, I have to be sure. You're sure until you really, when you really are 100% sure, and then go and, and you're stepped. That's in relation with sexual, the sexual path, the stone. Because the angels will always help you, it says, right? And the devil tempt you. It is written. And your God will send angels in order to help you there. He says, mm -mm. you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. This is what he answered. Let us read if this is really what he answered. He says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil take him up into the exceeding high mountain and show him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And said unto him, All these things will give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You see? The mind again is always tempting you. How is Satan 
offering the worlds to the initiate? Well, there's, uh, uh, do you want to appear in the internet with a beautiful tunic? And you write your name there? And everybody will know that you're a master. And they will worship you. Not only from this, in the, now in the internet, of course, uh, there are many people from different places. They will know that and they will write to you. And then the, if you do that, you are worshiping me, obviously, right? The Satan, the mind. Pride, vanity. And then if you don't pass the test, and then that's the problem. Because only if the being commands it. But if it's necessary, but it's not necessary, it's only uh, the, uh, someone that didn't pass the test. And then what happened? Jesus says, Satan, Satan, mind, mind, don't tempt me to do that. It is written, you shall always worship your inner Buddha, your inner being. You, the mind, has to kneel. I don't have to kneel. I am the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, here, the human soul. How am I going to kneel to the mind? I kneel to my being, but not to you. And you have to kneel to me and to my being, because you have to obey God. You, the mind, you, the intellect, are an instrument for the spirit. And you have to kneel. This is how Jesus, as Buddha, defeated Mara and the three daughters mm. to these temptations, which are, of course, hypnotized because it falls in many temptations. And this is how you uh, uh, defeat that by meditation, by comprehension. You're not just there, as many people think, that you are walking in the street and, and you feel lost. And my Divine Mother, I'm not letting me this. You feel anger. So my Divine Mother, I'm not letting me this anger. This is not just like that. You have to comprehend. You have to understand the path. You have to see the path. And the path has to be shown only inside. The symbols of, 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 the, of the archetypes. Symbols that you see in your dreams, in your visions. Of course, Gnostics write to us, they talk to us. What about the symbol? What about this? What is my father? What are many beings telling me this? Well, the symbol symbolize that, but remember that I'm telling you according to my own experience. But it could be the opposite. It could be the contrary. Meditate. Analyze. The whole thing is really uh, a work that we have to perform within. And it's only through meditation, because through reflection, through analysis, superlative analysis, is how we are knowing ourselves. Then know thyself, and you will know the universe. But each one of us, I repeat, has his own idiosyncrasy. And after the Buddha defeated Mara and the three daughters, it's an illuminated one. You go there and teach. And show the path. Every initiate does the same thing. Or did the same thing. And we have to do the same thing. Do you realize now what meditation is in this Is necessary? It's impossible. If somebody doesn't meditate to see the path or to advance on the path. Because the path is only shown in advance through meditation. And it's sexual also. It's shown with the stone. is sex. The waters, the serpent in Buddha, is sexual forces. that You have to defeat because from sex comes everything. That's why there's a lot of students of Krishnamurti, which in parentheses, Krishnamurti is a great initiate. It's a bodhisattva. But it's not self-realized. It's a process of self-realization. All of his students, or the students of Krishnamurti, follow his techniques, which are good, wonderful. 
But unfortunately, he never mentioned about sexual, how to transmute the sexual energy. The same thing with the monks, with the lamas. They know about the techniques, etc. But the main thing, which is tantra, sexual magic, they don't teach it. So all Buddhists and students of Krishna Murti and other all other esotericists that do meditation and that fight against their ego, they don't take care of the sexual force. They keep fornicating, ejaculating the sexual force. So therefore, they're wasting their time. And this is one of the points also that we have to understand. The main source in order to acquire samadhi and in order to understand, you see, understanding is bina, the sexual force. That's why the first step is the baptism. After receiving the waters of baptism, you are being tempted. Because those waters of baptism has to, have to be transmuted through all the paths until everything is dead inside of us. And it's through meditation the way that we do it. Do you understand that? Are you following that? Do you comprehend that? Do you have questions? In Buddhism, um, obviously they talk about emptiness, <coughs> the void, right? Absolute. Now, is that samadhi? Is it the same thing as samadhi? Yeah. There are many types of samadhis. You can experience samadhis in the astral plane, in the mental plane, in the causal plane. You can uh, experience uh, Maha Kalpa Samadhi, which is an experience in, in the Ains of, in the Absolute. And in different levels, uh, in, for instance, every Sephira is a kind of Samadhi. And this is without even eliminating the ego? Without eliminating the ego. Because a Samadhi is the experience of the Burata, not of the ego. What is a samadhi, in other words? Samadhi, in the synthesis, in, in simple words, is this. The way in which the Burata releases himself from within every and each one of the egos. It's like, imagine that you have 100 egos, and you are the Burata. So you have 100 suits on top of you. So you take your first suit, and then another suit, and another suit, until you are completely naked. And that is done through a technique in meditation. So finally, when the Burata took all of his vestures, devil, devilish vestures, and he's naked, it flies. And have a samadhi. And then experience in any of the sephira. But you can be united in samadhi, in the astral plane, the mental plane, and even go to the absolute. And after that, you return and put your suit again, unfortunately. And then you go and have a hundred suits. On, but we have no hundred, we have like 10,000 suits. Right? And that's a samadhi, simple. But the people that experience that and are skillful in that, they experience many samadhis every day. In the mountain, they are skillful in taking the suits easily. Because after you meditate and follow techniques, you can do it easily. And have samadhis and samadhis. But I went there, return, and then you think, oh, I am an illuminated one because I am skillful in this. But then you die and you return with your suits again. And where is the civilization? Your ego is still there. It's a waste of time if you don't annihilate your ego. Because a samadhi is beautiful. It's, it's, it's great. It gives faith. It's a blessing. But it's not enough. You have to annihilate your ego. You have to acquire self-realization. And that's only possible by comprehension. In the 49 levels of the mind, all, all of that that you have within. Do you have another question? What is the relationship between Satan as the ego and Satan as Lucifer? Well, 
Satan specifically is the fallen Lucifer. Lucifer is fallen in each one of us and is Satan. In other words, it's mingled with the ego. Because Lucifer itself is a sexual force, the sexual potence. If we don't know how to handle that force, it creates ego. So that's why the most uh, smart way to explain that is with Greek mythology, with Prometheus. Prometheus is Lucifer in Greek mythology. And he's punished by being chained to the stone, to the rock of the Mount Parnassus. Right? And during the day, the ego of lust, the vulture, comes and eats his entrails. And during the night, that is fixed. The next day, repeat the same thing. That's the suplicius of Prometheus, which means that lust always destroys the sexual energy. That is the vulture that we have within. If we kill that vulture, and Hercules, <coughs> Hercules is the only one that does it. Hercules is Christ. Obviously. If we advance and, and follow the path of Christ, Hercules will come and kill that vulture and liberate Prometheus, which is part of the being. Because it's a shade of God, the only part of the being that mingles with the ego. Here, as you see, the only part of God that doesn't abandon us. That part of God even goes to hell with us. And the nature destroys the ego, and Prometheus is liberated through a very painful way. So here, and we damned, people damned Lucifer, meaning and he's the only part of the being that is there. And that's why... Being Lucifer, the creator of your ego, because you use the energy, sexual energy in the wrong way, he's the only way that can tell you how to defeat it. And he does it through temptation. And if you defeat temptation, he's happy. If you don't do it, I mean, if you don't do it, well, imagine, he's entangling your ego. So he suffers a lot. Do you always have to question your inner experiences? I question my inner experiences many times. And I wait and wait to see if what I saw is right. And if, especially if I'm going to, to, to give a step ahead. Because I know that this path is dangerous. Inside and outside. There's many dangers. So you have to question, to meditate, even if you find the answer. Sometimes I easily find the answer. Oh, this is that. But I said, wait, I have to wait. Who knows? Maybe the tempter is playing with me here. Yeah, especially when, when the step that you're going to do is sexual. So question, always. And be sure. Then how do you become sure of your inner experiences? Faith. You have to have telema, willpower, and a courage. You have to have the sight of an eagle, the courage of the lion, in a very delicate step. Comprende? You mentioned Yahweh earlier in the lecture. We understand Yahweh would not reveal the path to us in its entirety, but is it related to the negative awakening of the Kunda buffer, or does it have any merit? The Master has made mention of a Ru T as being a useful protective agent, and the Ru T is a component of Yahweh. Yahweh won't give you comprehension, only meditation. That's why the Master says you cannot combine psychedelia with meditation. I mean, sometimes there are people that are very dumb and they need to have this type of experiences with plants in order to develop faith. 
But once you are experiencing that, do not expect that by taking Yahweh or Yahe, whatever you want to call it, you will acquire illumination. You know? The master sometimes says, certain plants in Mexico, for instance, uh, I remember uh, uh, a book that I read, it says, but do you take this, this plant? It's asking the disciple to, to, the, to the master. He says, no, I don't. Why? Because I am not an idiot. You are an idiot. You need it. But after you experience that, you don't keep doing it. You have to develop that for yourself. You know? Comprehension is acquired through meditation. And this is why you have to understand. Not to be a slave of any plant. Because the man is called king of nature. Not nature, queen of, of, of the man. And if you are uh, uh, only depending on plants, when are you going to depend on your own Buddha? Your own guru? You have to follow your own guru. Your, your, your own inner being. And if you utilize jag, jage or another plant previous in order to experience and to have faith, well, it's okay, but don't keep doing it. Because that is not the path. It's just uh, like, how you call uh, those things that you put here? Crutches. Crutches. When you are lame. But the best uh, way for a lame to walk is Christ. There are images of Jesus healing people. And that is probably related. Yeah, it is related with that. When you cannot walk on the path, Christ is the only uh, healer. And that's the sexual force. Develop on the path. Exactly. You ha you cannot you must not have any dependency. Another question? Bodhicitta, yeah. Yeah, the Buddha is bottled up. When that Buddha is annihilated, I mean, when the ego is annihilated, that Buddha becomes a Bodhicitta. Of course, an illuminated consciousness that controls the mind under the direction of his inner Buddha. That's a, 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 a true self realized. That's a true bodhisattva. It's a long path. And I repeat the different uh, areas, scenarios of the path of the self realization are being shown through experiences in the whole life. And that's why you know in which part of the path you are walking by interpreting, by analy uh, uh, comprehending, analyzing that or those symbols that you see that your own guru, your own Buddha is showing you. Hmm? That you have to follow. And of course, you need to study the doctrine because the great masters left the symbols the signs in their writings in order for us to recognize, oh, I am here. But don't expect that you are going to follow in the same way or to walk in the same way. Or that the master saw this, I had to see the same thing. No. You see the same symbol, but in a different way. And... Uh, there is another question. With the first level of ego going to be comprehended intellectually, I mean, there's no intellect in, was it just experience of, you know, of the path, or is it internal experiences? Is it? You said the first level is the intellect. Right. That meaning that during meditation. You can comprehend your Buddha, you yourself, is comprehending the ego in the first level of your mind. Because remember that the ego hides within the 49 levels of the mind. So the Buddha, the consciousness, has to understand that to liberate the rest of itself from within these 49 levels. 
and does it through comprehension. So do not think or do not expect to comprehend the ego with the ego. That's why the burata has to be active. The little percent that we have free has to be active. And is by remembering the Buddha. By being here and now. We know that. Self-observation and self-remembering. That is the Buddha doing it. The mind interferes. But by meditating and comprehension, we will find the difference between the mind and the consciousness. How can, initiate, how can an initiate differentiate when he's doing good or doing bad in his inner work? Personally, I never identify with good or evil. One time, a friend of mine told me, you are really evil. What you did was evil. And then I said, I don't know if it was evil or good, and I don't want to judge that. The only thing that I know, that in order to do that, I, 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 in order to walk, I, I had to do that. And I did it. And I'm walking. If you just that evil, well, for me, what's good? So evil and good is according to the path. Sometimes, you know, really good and evil is like evolution and devolution. Sometimes you have to descend down in order to ascend and some egos are related with karma. That's why this meditation, silence in Buddhism, <coughs> is associated with that blessing of the Lord. Blessing are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Who are the ones that mourn? The initiates. Because when you enter into this path, you suffer. You suffer because you have karma. And the karma is put in front of you in order for you to walk. And the laws of karma come. It is written, Master Samael says, sometimes laws of karma and even the parts of your being come to you after you comprehend an ego. And they talk to you like this. Aha. Uh -huh. So you want to annihilate this now? And to enjoy the blessing of annihilation after you enjoy this for many lives? No, you have to suffer the consequences first, and then we annihilate it. And this is you mourning there, because this is the law. Otherwise, everything will be easy. You will be comforted, but after you pay what you owe. You see, this is the third time that the Master Samael went up to his father. It was very painful for him. Because if it's so easy, and then he will fall again. He said, if you want to do it again, well, the fourth time will be harder, and the fifth harder. And obviously, that's why it says, blessed are, are the ones that mourn. We are the ones that are mourning all, all the time. But blessed are those who mourn, and if they meditate, because they will be comforted. But if you are mourning there, you think it's because you are sacrificing for humanity and you are giving lectures. I said, oh, I am mourning. I have my karma. Of course, oh, I'm going to be blessed. No. If I meditate, if I comprehend, I will be comforted because the comforted is the Holy Spirit. You will be comforted means your Holy Spirit, your inner Buddha, your inner God will annihilate that ego. And then you will be free of it. Hmm? But there are many laws of the law of karma that will be after you. And precisely it's coming into my mind the case of the Master Samael. Being in Samadhi, in the world of Atman, he was being as Atman, you know, as his own particular Buddha. A lord of the superior karma, the lord of Katansia, came to him and said, well... Now you have to answer because you are criticizing and you criticize many people in your books. 
down there in the physical world. You have to pay for that. Then the answer of the master says, well, I am a warrior by nature. I belong to the ray of power. So all the initials of the ray of power are strong, and they talk very strong in order to help humanity, whatever. Okay, but you have to pay what you owe. And what happened? He says that the lords of Catancia put him seven days into jail, into the intellect, in other words, because this is how the law works. He was criticizing through the intellect. Now he's going to pay through the intellect by being bottled up with the intellect for seven symbolic days, not seven days or 24 hours, symbolic days. He was suffering a lot, he says, because he was liberated. He can go easily into the astral plane, to the mental plane, any plane as he wishes. But during these seven symbolic days, he was like any one of us, fighting for going out, and he couldn't. Why? Because he was paying what he owed. And that's precisely mourning, you see. And finally, when he paid that, he was comforted. Because he was, again, enjoying his samaris. So it's the same with us. We are in this path, and we want con complete illumination, immediate experiences. Meanwhile, we owe a lot. And the laws of karma are going to give us and take from us according to our deeds. This is the path of civilization. It's very painful. That's why it's symbolized by Master Jesus taking the cross on, on his shoulders, mourning. He was mourning there. But he was blessed because he was pain. Who was behind the Master Jesus Christ while he was carrying his cross? He was an executioner, a lord of karma with a great whip. Don't stop, walk, and walk, and whip in him. That's precisely the symbol of willpower that the laws of karma said, walk ahead, walk ahead. And you are <coughs> suffering by carrying your own cross until you go to the Golgotha and you die there. That's the self-realization. That's the path shown by Master Jesus. So blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. That is a sentence that is being accomplished in the long run. Yeah? We can be doing good thinking we're creating in heaven, but we can be going the wrong way. So how can we find out for oneself if we're going up or down? If you don't have the same egos. If the egos are disappearing, you are doing good. But if the egos are still there alive and you are awakening with the age, you are bad. The ego has to be annihilated. If the ego is annihilated, you are doing good. So Not good, very good. In daily life, how do you do that? Well, if you are awakened, if you see a woman without lust, you are good. But if you see a woman and there is lust there, you are very bad. Simple. Yeah. Would you equate the various levels of being with different areas of consciousness in the mind? In other words, remembering or locating these areas in the mind as a map will help you to get back there again whenever you need to. The 49 levels of the, of, of, of the mind are related with klipoth, meaning that parts of the being are bottled up in those 49 levels. Obviously, if you annihilate some egos or some levels, you acquire experiences in the higher levels. <coughs> Remember, 49 levels of the mind means the mind is matter. And that mind is the ego. And the ego is that part that has trapped that part of the consciousness or part of the being. That's why it is written that the 40 uh, levels up, or for 42 to 49, is related with Atman. It doesn't mean that Atman has ego. It means that part of him is bottled up in hell, in Klippath. And by annihilating those parts in Klippath, that part of him is recuperated and going to Atman. Because the ego is always in Klippath, in hell. 
Do you understand that? If you save someone from drowning because you want to accumulate dharma and you, you, and you really don't care about that person, does that give you less dharma than if you do it out of compassion? Well, that's a, uh, that's a question that really, obviously, if somebody's drowning there and you want to help, you help. If you don't help, you, you gain karma, obviously, because you can do it. You pay karma for the evil that you do and for the good that you can do if you don't do it. Listen, if I have the intention of making money and I get a job and they said you will make $15 per hour, after one day I have how much if I work eight hours? But are you doing it for the money or for the work itself? Even if I don't do it for the money, they will pay me anyhow. Of course. So that's the point. If you do whatever you do, you will be paid. If your intentions are not to get the money well, it doesn't matter. You will be paid. It's like Master Jesus. He did a great job here. He's being paid for it. He didn't do it for the payment, but he, law is the law. It doesn't matter if you do it with the intention of receiving. Of course, the great sacrifice that you can perform is without expecting the reward. But after doing the sacrifice, the loss of karma comes and says, okay, we are going to pay you. Ah, I, I didn't do it expecting any reward. We don't care you didn't do it. Here's your payment and do whatever you want to do with it. Law is the law. This is the Dharma. You want to give it away? If you do something good, then we will come to you again because you are making more good and we will pay you even if you don't want it. Keep giving away what you want, but we will do our job, which is to pay what we owe. You see, that's karma. And that's why they collect to you. They collect from you also your karma. That's the law. So to free yourself from the law of karma is very difficult, whether in the good or in the bad. The, well, it's a good example of that is, too, doing bad. Sometimes we don't know that we're doing bad. Like, we do an action, and we didn't realize, you know, that it was something that was bad. You're still going to have to pay for it, even if you knew that was bad or not. Yeah. The intent, no matter what intention. So the same applies for the good. That's the case, the case of the great uh, uh, cosmocritical Sakaki. He did it with a good intention, but he did bad in the end. But he didn't know. You kill somebody with intention, you kill somebody by accident. You're still going to pay for it. Listen, this, listen this case, for instance. For this is other case. The case in Buddhism. Tolerance, right? The, the Chinese went to there and they were raping the nuns of Buddhism. The monks didn't do anything because of tolerance and because of no violence. They gained more karma because of that. If they would have killed those Chinese that were raping those nuns, they would accumulate karma, but not that much as the karma that they accumulated because they didn't do it. If somebody is in front of you trying to kill your spouse, if you kill that one, you will gain karma. But if you don't kill him, you will gain more karma. You realize that? Because you have to act. This is karma. I'm talking here good and evil. Karma is karma. Good or evil, whatever. It sounds like there's no law of accident then. Well, the result is what it speaks. Yeah. The result is what it speaks. It's not the intention. Intention doesn't matter. Whether you're good or bad intentions, you can have bad intentions of something that at the end was good, they pay you. Oh, but I was doing evil. Uh, this is what you owe or what you earn, period. If your intention were evil, well, you are stupid. You didn't go evil. <laughs> right? And this is what happened. The master wrote that. He said the action, the result is speaks. Whatever your intentions are, it's fine either way. But it's the, the result of your action that determines the measure. You can intend something good, but it's the result of that. <coughs> you pay that. For instance, here. I'm giving this lecture. I enjoy giving lectures. I always enjoy it. This is my own nature. But I will be, uh, I will be, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, I mean, if I don't admit that I am making here Dharma, it, will be, it won't be wise, right? I know that I'm making Dharma here. But it's not my intention, but I'm making it. 
right? Are we getting Dharma for listening? Yeah, obviously you are receiving the Dharma of listening. What you do with it is your business. But also you are helping me because you are sitting there or listening there. What is good to give if there is no somebody to take? Right? So good for me, good for you. But sometimes the things that I give are bad for others. It depends, right? I just want to clear up. So it's, it doesn't matter if you have good intentions when you do something. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, the laws of karma judge is the actions, not the intentions. If you have good intentions of helping somebody, you never do it. So... Yeah. Really yeah. He's like a friend of mine. Like he was always reading the books of the Master Samael. But he was always fornicating. And he says, Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to stand. I'm good. I'm good because keeping understanding. So then they say, one day he says, What the hell am I saying? I'm not good. I'm comprehending, but I'm not doing it. And he realized, Oh, finally, you realize that, right? He thought because he was understanding. It's like people that understand the Bible. Right? I believe in the Bible, but so what? If you don't do what the Bible is written there, if you don't comprehend there, it doesn't matter. Believe or not believe, that's just a matter of, of the mind, of Satan. Comprende? The wicked people that just intentionally do evil. Oh, what the, it doesn't matter. I mean, you told me it doesn't matter how awake you know, how awake you know. They are awakening people that do evil, yeah? Demons. Their intentions are good for them, obviously. But evil for you. And they have to pay that. And they have to pay that, but that's their business. I'm concerned always with, with my business. Because if I start worrying about the business of everybody, then I will be stagnant. I have enough things to worry about inside of me in order to worry about others. The only thing that I can do is to give lectures and to give guidance, steps, signs, and order for everybody to follow their own being. That's why we said, don't follow us. Follow your own being. In every lecture that we give, study it, analyze it, and take the best for your own self-realization. You know, no more questions. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's too much talk now. You say I had to eat too. <laughs>